everyone. Uh, my name is Sergei Shushkin, and I work as an engineering manager at uh, Standard Chartered. Uh, and today I'm going to introduce you to functional programming. Who is familiar with the term functional programming already? OK, who is new to it? OK, that's, that's very good. Um, so we will not talk about monads today. Is that OK with you? OK, good. So we'll, I'll try to approach functional programming from a different angle, from a practical perspective. So I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the term uh, most likely have tried a few tutorials, a few articles that try to introduce you to functional programming paradigm, try to explain uh, its foundations, its principles. And it might sound a bit scary in the beginning. It might sound that it's probably not uh, practical. It's more of a theoretical, um, like a puristic view on programming. So, and today I'll, I'd like to, to change that. Uh, please come to the front and uh, take seats at the front because I'll have some uh, code. So we'll try to build up understanding on functional programming principles from, from the foundation. So don't panic. Uh, my own journey with functional programming started around 2007, 2008 maybe when I was a C-sharp developer at the time and Microsoft uh, released C-sharp 3.0 with uh, language integrated query uh, and Lambda syntax. So way, way, way before Java got Lambdas. So uh, I really like language integrated query because I could like, write a shorter code uh, for basic operation of uh, basic processing of data right away. Uh, but I still was neglecting the, the fundamentals of functional programming. I was doing functional programming in the small, in, on the micro level, but didn't understand how to, uh, how to apply it to, to the design. Uh, I was still thinking, no way uh, I can write a line of business application in a totally functional way. Uh, I still need classes and factories and object-oriented paradigm for that. So um, I was a denier for a long, long time. Um, and probably some of you are in the same position. So you've heard about the term. You've tried it. You might have dismissed it, or you might have liked it. Uh, but maybe I'll, I'll give you a different perspective. And hopefully now you'll get it. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask questions if something seems uh, not uh, quite clear. So we'll start with, um, with a challenge that, with an example that we'll go through. So we'll write a program that will compute the sum of squares of the first even natural numbers up to 10. So in fact, on a Second line, I already have this program written. So it, it's a pretty trivial uh, problem to solve, uh, but it will teach us some lessons. So what if the maximum number is actually quite big, right? So this sort of uh, writing down as a mathematical expression doesn't scale. So uh, we need the real world program. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with some programming language. So who is familiar with Java? Whose main language is Java? OK. Whose main language is JavaScript? OK. C Sharp? Ruby? OK. Any functional language? OK, a few. Good. So <clears throat> the real world program. So I choose Java uh, for my examples uh, deliberately. So this is a talk on functional programming in a most non-functional language. So the point I'm trying to make is it doesn't matter the language. What matters is the principles and the concepts. So this is a pretty trivial program. 
Uh, most of you who did some programming as a hobbyist or as a professional uh, would recognize um, a function with an argument, a maximum number, um, a variable to hold our result, a loop uh, from one to the maximum. So we're looping from one because we're not interested in zero. And we're looping to maximum inclusively. Uh, and then we check if the number is even uh, by dividing, uh, by doing a modular division uh, and adding up uh, multiplication of a number by itself. So this is trivial. I hope it's not a surprise for anyone that the result of this program will be in, in fact 220. So, but there are a few problems with this. So, uh, who would say this code is clean? Like if I make a pull request in, on your project with this piece of code, you would say it looks good to me and merge it. Looks good? Does it look good? What's wrong with this code? Yeah, what's wrong? It's good, okay. <laughs> okay, so for, for, for the rest, uh, half an hour, I'll try to convince you this code is not good. Uh, let's try to enumerate uh, different responsibilities, different uh, actual functions or functionalities hiding in this trivial, minuscule piece of code. So we have a sum, so we are adding numbers. We are iterating, so we have an iteration. Uh, we have a filter. Uh, we have square, so multiplication. So, and this is a sum again. So sum, in fact, is actually uh, torn apart. You might argue that in this particular case, it's not an issue. So what about this one? So I took this code from uh, a repository. It's a refactoring uh, kata, an exercise. It's called Gilded Rose. So you, you basically take this code and you try to refactor it. You have some tests and you write some more tests and you try to, it's, it's like you're deployed on a project, you open up the editor, your ID, and you see a mess. And your objective is to make sense of the mess. Um, you obviously don't see it, right? Oops. Uh, okay, it's supposed to work but it messes up with the presentation. So I'll just try to zoom in. Um, deceptively in this code, you have this rhythm, items I quality, items I name. I would argue that every time you see this sort of a repetition, your brain thinks, oh, there is order to it, which is good, but this is a deception. In fact, when you have a code like this, a very repetitive, uh, very rhythmic code, it means your brain turns off and is not paying attention. So your code has to be really, really like, unique. Important parts have to jump out. Otherwise, you don't really understand what's going on there. Um, how many responsibilities are here in this code? Can anyone tell at all? So I've made a small modification, two modifications. Who can support modification that I made here? Which made this totally incomprehensible in terms of logic. Plus one? Last line? No. Plus one. Ah, plus one, yeah. Boom. What are we doing here? So we were iterating through a list, and suddenly, in some conditions, we are jumping to a, like a totally different index. So this modification alone makes this much, much harder to reason about, to understand what is going on, and what it also means is that we have pieces of code, but those pieces of code are individual statements. So in the text, they're vertically aligned, we can rearrange them, but 
not at any possible, like not in, in any way, right? There is a certain dependency of all the code lines. And when we introduce mutable variables and this, what I call, uh, not what I call, but what is called statement-based programming, um, we sacrifice an opportunity to encapsulate code and to uh, refactor it with ease. So another one will be this one. This is even worse. Uh, you don't even know what at this particular point in time uh, quality of this item is, right? So you assign it to an index and then like, of course you wouldn't do this in, in your real application, <laughs> of course. Uh, but wouldn't it be nice if you had an assurance that in your code, the code that you look at, there is no such a possibility of such things even happening and hiding inside your code. So let's put these things here. So we have statements. Statements as opposed to expression are that there is a line of code, it does something, I don't know, it modifies the universe. After this line is executed, the universe is different, but I cannot grasp it. Expressions, on the other hand, all have values, right? So zero is an expression, it has a value. And um, x modular divided by two equals zero is an expression, right? It's a value, it evaluates to uh, true or false depending on x. So I can hold this value. But statements like if are not expressions, I cannot capture the value they just execute some random code. And those are evil. Um, and mutation makes it hard. So mutation and statements together make this code harder to refactor and the previous example as well. So let's try to get rid of them um, in, in a series of refactoring. So just to recap, uh, in this small piece of code which some of you um, signed off to, for me to merge in your code repository and said it's good to go. Uh, we've identified violation of single responsibility principle multiple times, uh, mutable variables, and statement-based programming, which make this code harder to modify and harder to refactor. Just um, imagine I would ask you to refactor it in a way where you would need to filter a sum of even squares. Not squares of even numbers, but even squares. It's not undoable. It's, some of you would say pretty easy, but it's not trivial. And it's definitely not trivial in a program like this. Okay, let's try to first decomplect this uh, function. So decomplect is a term I uh, picked from Rich Hickey's talk, Simple Made Easy, where uh, complexing or complex means that things are intertwined and entangled. So we want to decomplect them. So all those four responsibilities that we saw in the a, in a first program, uh, we want to extract in the separate functions. And in fact, this is what we see. Can you see the code from the back row? Yeah, okay. So here we have a function iterate, which takes an integer and returns a list of integers. And the pattern is pretty easy. I just took the same approach. I have some result. In this case, it's not an integer, but it's a list. And I'm looping through, uh, I have the same looping function and I'm adding the, the results to the, to the list. And I'm returning the results. So if I call this function with three, I will get a list of one, two, three. So pretend that array syntax is a list. Uh, filter even takes a list and returns a list of even integers. Again, same thing. 
Here is the if statement. If I pass 1, 2, 3 as an array, I get an array with only one integer, 2. Same thing with square, same thing with sum. So any question so far on this code? Yeah? So are we trying to enforce single responsibility on this line? Yes. But we have like iteration and statements inside every function. Yeah, yeah, we still have. Um, OK, so iteration. We have a for loop in every of those functions. Um, but in this case, I would say that the responsibility of this function is to filter the input. The responsibility of this function is to iterate up to the maximum and return me the, basically a factory of a list. So even if we have a, a for loop, it's, it's, not it's not iteration responsibility on our domain level, if you will. And we still have statements and mutation. It's fine. We'll deal with them next. So now I can rewrite my function like this. So now I have expressions. Uh, every, every keyword here pretty much is an expression. So maximum is an expression on its own. When I wrap it with iterate, I get an expression of a result of 1, 2, 3. Uh, and so one up to max. Uh, when I wrap that one in a filter, even, I get a value of a filtered list. And square squares the results. And sum reduces them and sums them up to the, to the final result. This is some people would call DSL, domain-specific language. Uh, you totally can get your business stakeholders, your product owners, read this and even help you verify that this code is correct. And what's good is that you can now totally reorder the, uh, the function calls. For example, square and filter even have the same signatures. List of ints in, list of ints out. I can reorder them how I want. So we have expression-based programming. We have composable functions, which compose nicely together. Uh, we have functions which are testable in isolation. So each of them is trivial to test. Right? One responsibility, one reason to change um, one set of input parameters or edge cases. Uh, high reuse. Each of these functions can be reused in multiple contexts. Whenever you need to filter even numbers, this function will do. Again, try to um, project this on your own most complicated business application code. Uh, how this would look like in your daily coding, right? So we, we, we're taking this trivial example. I know you think that yeah, high reuse of such a function is maybe not very useful, but just try to think about your own code. So here we've seen a few concepts from functional programming theory. So one is pure functions. Uh, in our um, practical, practical sense, as long as function is static and it doesn't do any nasty surprises, doesn't change something else. Um, it just takes its arguments, evaluates the arguments, and gives the results, and gives the same results for the same arguments all the time. This function can be treated as pure. Uh, what pure functions allow is a property of code, which is called referential transparency. Referential transparency means every time I call a function with some values, I can replace this call with the value of the function's evaluation. So theory is nice. What about practice? So in practice, this means that when you look at the code, in your mind, you can abstract a piece of code with just a single value. So you know there is nothing hiding there. You don't need to keep track of any mutable state. 
any changes, any like indexes, uh, whatnot, you know that I'm just calling this function, I'm getting a value, nothing wrong can happen. Okay, so where are we? We've solved the single responsibility principle issue. We sort of solved the statement-based issue. So in our final program, uh, it's all expressions, but on the micro level, we still have statements, for loops and if statements, and we still have uh, mutable variables. So let's deal with those. Uh, who knows recursion? Okay. So before we dive in, uh, here, is a, here are a few helper functions that we will need uh, later on. Um, just to pretend that our Java list library has immutable data structures, immutable list. So one is to prepend. We prepend an element to a list. Uh, so type A, so this is a generic in Java, uh, basically means any type. Um, if we call it with one and a list of two, three, we get the list one, two, three. Uh, append, appends in the end. So if we have two, three as a list and uh, we append one, we get two, three, one as a list. Uh, tail uh, drops the first element of the list and returns the tail. So the first element is called uh, head. Uh, this is a head function. It always returns the first element of the list. And uh, concat concatenates two lists. So we'll see usage of those further. So let's look at our function iterate. Uh, so far, this is a for loop, classic one. Let's try to replace it with a recursion. What we have here, so same signature, same types in, out. In a recursion, we have this inductive approach. So we have a base case, which in this case would be if maximum number is zero. So if maximum number is zero, we don't have to iterate over anything. We just return empty list. Okay, so we've solved half of the problem already. So now, when you have this, uh, this case handled, you can handle the rest of it by induction. In this case, if maximum is not zero, we call iterate with the argument one less than the actual argument. So if it was three, it was two. Um, but if it was one, it would be zero. And we've solved that case. So when we call iterate with one, iterate of one minus one would be zero, so empty list. And we append max to the empty list. So we get the list of the element itself, and so on. <coughs> Any questions here? Clear, OK, good. Um, the same with filter. I'll not go into that much detail. I'll just highlight that in this case, the, the base case is different. So we're checking if the list is empty, and then we return the empty list. If the list is not empty, we're checking uh, the evenness of the first element, the head, and we prepend this element to the filter even of the tail. And in opposite case, it's just we, we continue uh, run recursive case. Uh, same with square. Same base case, uh, different induction case. Same with sum. Uh, almost same base case. The resulting of the base case is zero because the types are different. And the induction case is we're just adding the numbers with the result of the smaller problem. 
Did you see the boilerplate here? So let's look at filter even and square. And let's rewrite filter even in this way. So instead of having a conditional at the top level, we will have a concatenation always. Uh, but then what we concatenate is either result of a list with the head, with the first element, or the empty list. So now you see there is a pattern here. And we can abstract this pattern away. But how can we abstract it? Because it's a piece of code. So in object-oriented programming, we would need something like a template method or a base class. And then you think, oh, I don't want to deal with this. I just want to write, I just want to filter a list of customers and find the ones which are priority. Or I just want to manipulate a list of, uh, I don't know, numbers here. You don't want to create all those heavy object-oriented abstractions all the time. You want to abstract a piece of code. So luckily, in, uh, well, in Java 8, we have Lambda functions. We have some form of Lambda functions in pretty much every language. So who has, who have used Lambda function before? OK. Who have not? OK. <laughs> Who is too lazy to raise a hand? <laughs> <laughs> so meet higher order functions. Higher order functions are functions that return a function or take functions as arguments. That's why they're higher order. They're functions of functions. And the first higher order function we'll learn is flat map. So here we abstract our pattern of checking, so going through a list, xs, <coughs> and checking if the list is empty, then it, the result will be empty. If list is not empty, then we'll concatenate an application of a function that we pass here. So this function can be read as to this type signature here can be read as we have a function that takes an integer and returns a list of integers. So f returns a list of integers given an integer. So we give it an integer, the head. So we always look at the first element of the list. And then we concatenate the result, whatever that f function gave us. And we concatenate it with the uh, flat map of the tail. So now we can express filter even with flat map like this. So we pass the same xs and we pass a lambda function. So for every x, which is a number, we check if it's even. Then we return the list of that number, just of one element. Otherwise, we return an empty list. And square is even simpler. The f would be for every x, we return the list of just one element where this x is multiplied by itself, so squared. Any questions here? Yeah? So why we can't map here? Because like, you still create the list slash all the time. Why just don't avoid the creation of the list? Um, so we'll get to map further. Um, Right, so this is a Java 8 Lambda. JavaScript has the same, pretty much any other language has the same thing. Um, the next thing is fault. It's even more abstract. So a fault is a way of iterating through a list or through some collection. Having a zero element, so some result, 
This is of type R. And having a function which is takes two arguments. One is the current result, and another is the current element of type A, uh, which is A of a list. In our case, A is an integer, and R is also an integer. Most of the time, or a list, we'll see. So it's a combination function. And what it needs to do is to take the current result, the current element, combine them together to create the next result. And in a case when an input list is empty, we just return this zero element, so this result. Otherwise, we call the combine function with the sub uh, call to fold of a tail, so the, the sub problem, the sub list, uh, with the zero and combine, and, and the head. So combine will combine the list of folding the sublist, the tail, and the current head. So now we can express sum as a fold of a list with a zero as a starting sum, and then just a addition as a, as a combination function. But Flat map is actually not the, not the most primitive. So flat map can also be expressed as a fold because flat map is a fold of a, of a list where the result is empty list and the accumulation is just a concatenation with applying of the f function. Are you still with me? Okay. So more combinators. So those functions that try to like, go through a list, apply some function, uh, like take a list, reduce it to something, uh, filter it, are called combinators. For example, we have our filter even function, but we can have a more generic combinator called filter. And filter, in fact, is just a flat map where we have this uh, we have a predicate, so predicate is something that takes an element A and returns a true or false, so it's a testing function. So a flat map in this case uh, will test if the predicate is true, we return the, the list of this one element. If the predicate is false, we return an empty list, so we're not uh, concatenating them. And filter even now can be expressed as filter where the predicate is, is pretty trivial at this point. So now to the map, right? So flat map is a, is a bit cumbersome to use because when you want to go through a list and somehow modify an element uh, of, of this list into something, with flat map, you have to return a list, so you always wrap an element on a new list. So it's not efficient and it uh, uh, just, just doesn't read nicely. So we can use a higher level combinator called map, which can be expressed in flat map as iterating of a list where the, where the function is actually applying a smaller function and then wrapping it into a list. So a trivial modification, but now uh, we can express square as a map where lambda function is just a square multiplication. So map is really, really used all the time in functional code. So you have a list of customers, which are your objects or classes or JSON data structures or something you want the names. So you would use map to convert a list of customers into a list of names, where your lambda function would be an accessor of a name of, an, of a customer object. Any questions here? So we've used a lot of recursion.
but don't try it at home. So recursion is a theoretical foundation. So what it allows us is to build this reasoning and understanding of our programs and our functions, but by no means is it an efficient way uh, to write programs, especially in Java. Because, for example, Java doesn't have uh, a tail call recursive optimization. So there is a way to write recursive functions in such a way that compiler can optimize them into for loops. So because your processors under the hood, they still run something like machine code, which is like assembler, which is just executing instructions and doing jumps and doing all those things that humans can hardly understand. So that's why it's important to keep thinking in terms of recursive functions and pure functions, but keep in mind that under the hood, those recursive functions can be actually implemented in a performance optimized ways with traditional for loops and mutable variables. But they don't have to be. And for practical reasons, you can treat those functions as pure without any mutable variables. So use combinators and high order functions. And so for those who use Java, um, what we've just done, we've pretty much reinvented the wheel with all this map, flat map, filter, because in Java we have since Java 8, uh, Stream API, which allows us to write our initial program in this way, right, without any of the functions that we wrote before. So we have int stream, so it's a helper class to generate streams of integers. So stream, you can treat it as a collection, a list, or something that you can iterate over. Uh, in this case, we create a closed range from one to max. This is what we've achieved with our iterate function. And we filter this stream with a predicate is even. So it's an int predicate is even. So we saw it before. And then we map the elements of the result with the square function, which is int unary operator, which means it basically takes one argument, returns the same type as a result. Uh, and then we sum. And it's all provided. It's all in your JDK since when, when Java 8 came out? It's Java 10 now. Who have used Stream APIs already? Yay. Right, so here you go. Java Util Stream. has all these usual suspects, map, filter, flat map, and so on. So to recap, this is a comparison of our programs. So we started with this trivial, very, very simple program, which had multiple statements which were hard to rearrange, which, do, which are not possible to compose because they have no value, right? They're just statements. They do something, but we cannot capture the value. Here we have a single expression and multiple sub-expressions, right? Each of them is a sub-expression that can be captured as an individual value and tested. We have a mutable state all over the place, although it's not a lot, but just two variables are mutating. Here we have few functions. We have entangled code, so four responsibilities uh, without a clear view of like how they depend on each other. Here we have reusable functions and a clear, straight uh, understanding of how they depend on each other. This one is harder to test. You cannot test things in isolation. You have to uh, treat this function as a whole, which multiplies the number of test cases you need. Uh, 
This one is trivial to test because every piece of, you, you don't need to test stream API in Java. So trust it works. Other people tested it. And this code is pretty much obviously correct. So you might want to test your uh, predicates, your transformation functions. You might just have a, like, one end-to-end -end test to ensure that this thing as a whole is wired correctly. So thank you. And because we have some more time left, I would like to um, mention a couple of things on performance. So many people are concerned that functional programming is not performant. So sometimes it's true if you use recursion and without tail call optimization, and if you don't know what it means, you probably don't need to know. Uh, again, as I mentioned, don't use recursion in your own code uh, unless, unless the, 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 the numbers uh, you're dealing with are pretty small. Uh, just use the library functions that implement those recursive and pure combinators in a performant, optimized way. And so uh, Java has some immutable data structures. Other languages like uh, Scala or Clojure on JVM, um, on JavaScript you have immutable GS. So those come with immutable data structures. In our examples, we saw those functions like append, concat, that like, take the list. What you should have noticed is that those functions don't modify the arguments they receive. So they never modify the arguments. They always return a new value. Sometimes it's inefficient, but it can be done pretty much efficiently. And usually when you use a proper immutable data structure library, it's implemented in a very efficient way. Of course, if you're doing a lot of number crunching, uh, you might still want to go down to using just normal arrays. That's fine. But then you know what you're doing, and you're not writing these programs in, in the large. You're optimizing it in, in the small. And you still treat the can, composition of your program as, as a pure function. And a couple of words on testing. So when you have small pure functions, they're trivial to test. You don't need any mocks. Who is using mocks for, for tests? As in like, you cannot test without mocks, right? Mocks is something you really, really need for testing, right? When you do functional programming, you don't need any mocks. Because all functions take arguments which are simple values, integers. When you have a function like filter that filters lists. I don't care whether it filters lists of customers or integers or strings. There is no possible bug in the implementation of the filter function that can surface because you're passing not a list of integers but a list of strings. So filter has to work on any list, right? So you can test things like that much easier with simpler primitives. And referential transparency allows for um, formal proofs. So if you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend a Coursera course by Martin Odersky, author of Scala, uh, called Functional Programming in Scala. Uh, what he does, he introduces some of these concepts uh, like flat map and fold and also immutable data structures. And what he does, he does like mathematical proofs that those functions are correct. Right? So this would not be possible with, or would be much, much harder to do with, with the program we started with. OK, and on that, please ask your questions. I have all the code. Uh, as well, so we can go back if you have any particular questions. Yeah. Uh, I have a question around the mocking part. So 
So when you say like no box required, I'm assuming you, are, you mean that you don't want any test doubles, right? But even in functional scenarios, when you're testing it, like suppose you're taking in one of the parameters is a higher order function, I would still rather pass a spike rather than pass create a fake function that returns that particular type. So I just want something that fits that shape. So it is still a test double. Okay. Yeah. So, like uh, so the Okay, so the question is uh, probably for the record more um, what's the difference between not what's the difference between mocks and test doubles, but where to draw the line that no mocks are needed? So, in this case, um, you write test doubles are fine, and if you're passing like you, in the real world, in the real application, you would filter a list of customers, but you just want to test your filter function or filter predicate. Uh, you, right, you can just construct a list of simpler objects, and those uh, go as test doubles, I think. Right? Uh, but where, what I mean by saying that mocks are not needed is that you don't have objects and interfaces and classes where you need to change some behavior because in functional programming, your program is constructed out of very small, very like, highly specific building blocks, which are very trivial to test with just uh, like primitive arguments. So you don't need a heavy machinery. Well, where you would need mocks usually is when you have a service that does some remote communication. And you would like to mock it when you're testing your consumption part, right? your consumer. But in this case, you can, I guess, write it as a, as a, as a pure function few functional code where you don't need a mock. Does it answer a question? Sort of. Okay. We can discuss afterwards. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, so the, the question on exceptions, uh, if functional functions or pure functions are allowed to throw exceptions, no, they don't, because then they break this uh, property of pureness and uh, especially referential transparency. So what is the value of exception? When you throw an exception, what is, what is the value? Like you all have a function uh, sum that sums a list of integers and you expect an integer, and your function throws an exception. So what was the sum? You don't know. So functional programming deals with this, not all languages, but mostly um, strictly typed functional languages deal with this uh, by introducing uh, types for wrapping results which are ambiguous. Like in Java, you would have optional type, or you would have, um, like in Scala, you would have a try, uh, which can capture two different types of results. One is the actual result. When things go well, this would be, so your sum, if it potentially can, can fail, it would return a try of int, right? And in normal case, there would be int captured in this wrapper data type. And in the failure case, there would be no exception thrown, but exception will be captured in the failure uh, compartment of this try wrapper. So uh, I didn't cover this here, but if you're interested, uh, please look up uh, optional and uh, failure types in uh, languages like Java and Scala. Any other questions? 
Or what other questions do you have? So for those who were not familiar with functional programming or were dismissive of it, do you understand it better now? Yes, no, maybe? If no, please speak to me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.